reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9 to 12 and Ian Cousins of Clocherney Presbyterian Church reading Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 20 to 35 and our service will conclude with congregational praise from Clocherney Presbyterian Church singing love divine all loves excelling and you're very welcome to join in with that hymn uh, at the conclusion of our service uh, today also. Our thanks to all who are taking part today and especially to our producer Andy Bell. Our theme for today is a holy ambition. As we join together to worship may we be encouraged with the words of John's Gospel chapter 13 and verse 35. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let us pray together. Our faithful Heavenly Father, of all mercy and hope, we praise you today for this opportunity to gather around your inspired word and to worship you for who you are, our everlasting, eternal God, provider of all things great and small. Today we ask that you would be with those in our communities who are volunteering to help others in so many different ways, that their simple acts of kindness will make a big difference in the lives of the most vulnerable in our society. O oh Lord, we pray for those in government as they begin to implement the plan to lift lockdown, that the peace will not lead to another peak of infection. We pray too for families with children or teenagers at home in this lockdown. We pray Lord for wisdom for their parents, for a creative balance between the schooling at home and ordinary home life and watching over the general welfare of those under their care. We pray too for parents who cannot stay at home but must work as they find care we pray that as they find care for their children that they will find a safe and creative environment for that caring we pray for one another as members of the family of God that even in the challenges of not being able to gather to gather in church in the meeting house to worship May you also spur us on to a greater hunger for reading your word individually and as families. O oh Lord, we pray that the season of uncertainty in our society will lead to a questioning in minds and hearts about people's relationships with you and that many will turn to you and know your saving love for their lives. O Lord, hear our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, we pray. Amen. Let us turn to God's Word. This time we're reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9 to 12. And it's read by Rachel Mullen. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other, and in fact 
you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we have told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Thank you, Rachel. Now, boys and girls, are you sitting comfortably? Monkey Nose is sitting comfortably. Well, I'm sure you've all many wonderful ideas about what you want to be whenever you grow up. Some of you may want to be a doctor. Others may want to be a lorry driver. Some might want to be a teacher. Others a nurse. These are great uh, and wonderful prof professions for our careers. And it is good for us to be ambitious and set ourselves targets that we can meet. There are some targets that we may not meet, but it is still good to set targets <clears throat> so that we can continue to improve in our lives. Just wonder, can you think of someone who has set a modest target and smashed it and has become a very popular person and maybe even famous? Well, Monkey Nose was thinking of Captain Orr, or as his new title or rank is now, Colonel Tom Orr. Tom, that is his new uh, honorary rank. Tom set out to walk around his home a hundred times for his hundredth birthday. And along the way, he thought it'd be all right if I raised a few pounds for the NHS charities. He achieved his target of a hundred times around his home. In fact, he smashed his target and he has achieved uh, something in the region of 33 million pounds for NHS charities. And that was wonderful and a wonderful ambition to smash. There has been many other great and wonderful examples, including children with disabilities who have walked challenging distances to raise funds for NHS charities as well. It is great to have targets to meet and to smash. I'm going to read you a very special story today about a man who wanted to have a new life for himself. And I'm going to read it from this little book. Some of you have seen it before. It's The Treasury of Bible Stories by Kelly Pulley. A special story. And Monkey Nose is going to help us uh, today with our story. Let's open up. It's the story about being lost and found based on the parable of the prodigal son. One day... Jesus was preaching on sinners and, sinners and such when some teachers of the law saw the crowd. He welcomes the sinners and eats with them too. They muttered with voices too loud. Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The youngest son had said to his dad, Father, give me now all the shares that are mine. He divided the wealth that he had. Soon the youngest son left with his money in hand. He moved to a land far away. He spent all his money on fanciful clothes and on food and on drink and on play. It didn't take long for his wealth to be gone. Then a famine came over the land. The son had no money and nothing to eat and no one to lend him a hand. He needed a job. But the best he could find was a job feeding piggies their slop. With no food in his tummy, the slop sounded yummy. He wanted the hunger to stop. He thought of the workers who worked for his dad. They always had plenty to eat. Instead of me starving, I'd go to my dad and I'd humble myself at his feet. I will say... I'm not worthy of being your son. Let me work as a servant instead. So he came to his senses and headed for home from the slop 
and the piggies he fed. His dad saw him coming quite a far way off. He hurried to him at a run. He hugged him and kissed him. The boy said to his dad, I'm not worthy of being your son. The dad told his servants, Now quick, bring a robe and bundle the robe around my son. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and then cook up a feast when you're done. My son, who was lost, is now found and at home, and everyone there started cheering. When the older son finished his work and returned, he said, What's all this music I'm hearing? A servant explained that his brother had come, and his father had ordered a feast. Now the brother got angry, refusing to go, thinking it wasn't fair in the least. When his father came pleading for him to come in, he said, Look! All these years I have slaved, I have done all the stuff that you have asked me to do. I have always been good and behaved. I have not even gotten a goat for my work, but my brother is given a feast. Though he has been sinning and wasting your wealth, I am not honouring you in the least. My son, said the father, what's mine is all yours. You have been home, you have stayed safe and stayed sound. We must celebrate knowing your brother's alive because he who was lost is now found. Boys and girls, a wonderful story today. This man in the story, the prodigal son, he had an ambition to go and do great and wonderful things. But he didn't manage to fulfil his ambition. And sometimes that happens to us in life as well. We're not able to fulfil our dreams and our ambitions. But do you know what? As we read that story, we noticed that the thing that his life turned out even better than he even could have expected himself. He was loved by his father who welcomed him home. And boys and girls, as we think of this parable, And the ambitions that we have in life, some of them will work, some of them may not. But always remember, Jesus loves you. Trust him with all of your heart and you will always be his forever and ever. Let us pray. Our loving God, we thank you, Lord, for the parable of the prodigal son and the wonderful lesson it teaches us to trust you and to come to you. No matter what way our life is, we can always come to you. You will always love us. And Lord, we ask that you will be with our boys and girls in these days, helping them with their schoolwork at home and keep them safe as well. Lord, bless us all, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Let us turn once again to God's word. This time it is from Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 20 to verse 35 and it is read by Ian Cousins of Clocherney. The reading is from the book of Proverbs chapter 6 starting at verse 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a warish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth, Into his neighbour's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief, 
if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonour shall he get, and his reproach shall be shall uh, not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Thank you, Ian. Today, as we come to verses 9 to 12 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, we continue to reflect on who we are in Christ. Last time we thought about relationships. Relationships are a hot topic in this present time, and passages like those of the first eight verses are championed in the relationship debate at the expense of this portion that we have under consideration today. Verses 9 to 12 focus on our personal relationship with God himself and how we work out our relationship with Christ in our everyday tumble of life. This passage speaks to us about having the right kind of ambition in our relationship with God. Earlier there with the children, we had a discussion about what we want to do when we grow up. That is great and it helps our children to develop into well-rounded adults and leaders for our next generation. However, if you are, say, my age and dreaming about what you want to be when you grow up, we have a problem. These verses bring a certain focus for us to our walk with God. It is a holy ambition. How we develop our relationship with God. There are at least two types of ambition. There is the one which many of us are familiar with in the workplace or generally in society around us. It is the clamour for promotion to the top of the career ladder or getting to the front of the queue. That is ambition as the world around us sees us. However, the Bible teaches that selfish ambition can be unfulfilling. Maybe you've seen a situation like this happening. There are many a uh, hard charging dog eating, uh, dog eat dog businessmen and women out there who spend all of their adult lives scratching and clawing their way to the top of the ladder of success. And then when they get there, they discover that their ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. It's empty. There is a wonderful kind of ambition that we call holy ambition. A holy ambition is striving to do what God wants us to be doing. When you place your life under the Lordship of Jesus, you find that whatever God wants you to be doing, you want to be doing it too. That is your ambition in the Lord's will. We're to have a love for others. In verse 10, Paul wrote, you do love all of God's family, yet we urge you to do some more, to do so more and more. Paul loved these believers in Thessalonica and they loved him. He had a reputation for loving other believers as well. Paul commended them for this, but he warned them not to be satisfied. He encouraged them to let their love for each other grow deeper and wider. At that time, Christianity spread through the Roman world because of its love. We have no historical records of missionary programs 
or evangelistic events for this time. But we have examples of this type of love and the world around those people noticed it, just as Jesus said it would. In the city of Thessalonica, everyone would have noticed the change in the life of these Christians. The change was noticeable. They did not participate in the religious ceremonies and the immorality of the pagan temples. They did not cheat each other or strangers. And they worked hard and took care of each other. Today we may say they stuck out like a sore thumb. If you want your faith to be evident to those around you. Paul is telling us this, to live in a sacrificial way that reflects the love of Jesus to other people. And that is the way to go. The Bible tells us the definition of love as Paul described it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 4 to 8. Paul says this, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps rec no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never Feels. As Paul is writing to the church, that is believers, I think he's asking us today to look around in our fellowship and in our community for people who need your love. A love which can be expressed in so many ways. This partly has been achieved by the Ochnacloy and Ballymagran Food Bank getting together to provide in a practical way for our communities here. And people beyond our fellowship have noticed and appreciate the difference that it has been made by being motivated by God in what we do. In the early portion of chapter 4, Paul has a big picture in mind for us. A picture that, is, that we would grow in our faith and in our trust and hope in the Lord. He has been pressing this point from the very beginning of chapter 4. <coughs> Verse 1, he says, Finally, brothers, we instruct you how to live in order to please God. As in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord to do this more and more. This theme has an emphasis on pleasing God in our lives. Although Paul is addressing the specific area of immoral relationships in those early verses. In today's portion, a brotherly love is the concern that is before us. And it fits within that broader framework of his two perspectives for the Christian life. The first of those perspectives, there must be Christian growth. These Christians were walking in a way that pleased the Lord. And Paul was urging them on in doing that, to do more and more. Paul called on them not to be satisfied in their present state as Christians, but to keep growing in the likeness of God. The Christian life does not have a point at which we can attain total maturity in this life. We do not stop growing as Christians. And if we think we are doing what Paul has described in this passage, we must not stop. We must continue. We must not grow weary in doing well, but rather continue to follow the path that Jesus has laid out for us. Growing for the Lord then it is followed by a sacrificial life. 
This would be the Christian virtue of unselfishness. The Christian life is marked to a great degree by sacrificial living. And we need to be hearing that message over and over and over again. Because we are inherently prone to be self-centred. Thinking about ourselves. As Christians we are called to please God. What are our ambitions in life? We are making good use, are we making good use of the abilities that we have? Or is our lives consumed with what we want for ourselves? As individuals, do we lead, do we lead a God-centred life or a, cent a self-centred life? Why is it important that we ask ourselves a question like that? Well, when we follow the one who has sacrificed himself for us, we follow the one who gave up everything that he had in order to bring us into a right relationship with himself. That is God. During this present pandemic, there are many examples of sacrificial giving all around us. There are many in the caring professions who are working far and beyond what they would normally be expected to do. Then there are the Captain Toms, going that extra mile to raise funds for charity. The food banks in our communities, helping individuals and families face the challenging times that we're in. And there will be many more opportunities, I believe, in the days that lie before us, when as Christ's followers we can demonstrate Christ's care and compassion in our communities. There are many channel, channels of opportunity in these present times which allow us to fulfil our Christian calling, as Paul concludes there in verse 12. He says, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. Paul sets a challenge before us in verses 1 to 12 of chapter 4. Before he moves us forward to consider that second coming of Jesus in his next section. Here in these verses, he draws our attention to relationships of all kinds. Relationships both in those around us, as we looked at just last week, and more importantly today, our individual relationship with the Lord Jesus. The relationship which is key to our eternal glory with him. You may have the ambition of being in heaven with your Lord. But what have you done in order to fulfil your ambition? Trust the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary to take away your sin, that barrier that prevents your entry into heaven. Leave it with him and move forward with your life and live for him and his coming glory. Paul reminds us that we must love others, we must grow with Christ, and we must live for Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the challenges of your inspired word for us today. Life for us is often an uphill journey. However, you have provided the means to overcome even the greatest of hurdles through the work of your Holy Spirit within us. O Lord, we ask that each of us would embrace the courage you have so willingly given us on Calvary, a courage which equips us for the future glory of life with you forevermore. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain and abide with us all this day and forevermore. 
Oh, man. Thank <laughs> you.